give God a shout of praise in this place. Hallelujah. Tell someone next to you that God is good. Come on, look at someone next to you. Tell them that God is good. Amen. You may be seated. How are you guys doing this morning? Come on, New Year, Matea. Amen. So I'm going to get right into what I think my father, um, the pastor of this house, for giving me another opportunity to share the word of God this morning. So I appreciate that. Thank you, Daddy. Um, we're going to get right into it um, because I, I really believe that God is really doing something with this message that he has given me and it's so funny because I was I remember when God gave me the message about the choice to love I was at work <laughs> I was at work I gave my students their bell ringer for that morning and as I'm sitting down waiting for them to be done this message about love comes so I kind of take my computer and I just begin to type and I believe God doesn't give anything if it's not needed amen amen so last week so this series I guess is called the choice to love so this would be part three we're going to do a review of last week. So last week we talked about two things. The first point we made is that love is the only thing we owe. According to Romans 13, 8 to 10, the word of God says, leave no debt remaining outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. For whoever loves others have fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. You shall not covet. And whatever other commands there may be are summed into one. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. So we talked about how the only thing we are we don't owe the enemy anything but what we do owe to God and to each other is love the second thing we talked about is obedience we talked about how obedience is God's love language usually when we talk about love language we're talking about romantic relationships between a man and a husband I mean a, a husband and a wife <laughs> <laughs> Obedience is God's love language. Obedience is God's love language. In 1 John 5 verse 3, it says, in fact, this is love for God. To keep his commands, and his commands are not a, are not a burden. So love for God is your obedience. We measure whether we are growing in love by the level of our obedience. I'm going to say that again. We measure whether we are growing in love by the level of our obedience. All throughout the Bible. All throughout the Bible, you will find scriptures and stories that support that the life of a true believer of Christ is a life of obedience. If you study the word of God, you will see this common theme of obedience and God despising disobedience. We see this common theme in the lives of the disciples they obeyed God they chose to suffer to their death 
jusqu'à la mort. To do what God told them to do. Pour faire ça bon Dieu dit au faire. One of my favorite people to read about. You know mon que même li de li. Is Paul. C'est Paul. You see how much he pursues and runs after the will of God for his life. Even if it costs him his life. Even if there's a high price to pay. You see that in the life of Paul, he values the will of God. In Philippians, Paul says, I count everything all lost. But what I count as something good or of value is knowing Christ. For Christ, I'll leave everything behind. For Christ, my accomplishments mean nothing. I count everything I've lost. All I want to know is who he is. So we see this common theme in the lives of the disciples. Let's go to Acts 5 verse 29. In Acts 5 verse 29, it says Peter and the other apostles replied, we must obey God rather than human beings. We must obey God rather than human beings. We see the same theme in Acts 4, verse 19. But Peter, it says, but Peter and John replied, which is right in God's eyes, to listen to you or to him. You be the judges. This is, Paul, this is Peter and John before They're asking them to stop preaching the gospel. Stop talking about this guy, Jesus. We don't want to hear it. And Peter and John reply, What is right in God's eyes? Do I do what you want me to do? Or should I do what he says to do? We see the same thing in the life of Jesus. Jesus is the ultimate example of what a life of obedience looked like. Jesus est plus grand exemple de la vie obéissance. In John 6 verse 38. He says, for I have come down from heaven not to do my will but to do the will of him who sent me. In other words, I'm on a mission to fulfill the will of God. I am his vessel and my purpose is to do what he wants. In Romans 5, verse 19, it says, For by one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners. So by the one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. Your obedience to God affects the generations after you. Your disobedience against God affects the generation that comes after you. See, it doesn't just affect you when you disobey God or you live a lifestyle of disobedience. It affects your family and everyone connected to you. The obedience of Jesus Christ brought about our redemption. I can stand here before you and, and speak the word of God. Because of his obedience. Because of his righteousness. We can call ourselves ministers. It's by one man's obedience. He made many righteous. Let's go to John 14 verse 31. It says, but I do as the father has commanded me. So that the world may know that I love the Father. Do you hear that? I do what the Father has commanded me to do. So that the world may know 
that I love the Father. Let me ask you this question. Does the world know that you love him? Do the people around you in your environment, your workplace, your friends, your school, do they know that you love him? Is there evidence in your life that you love him by the way that you obey him? Jesus says, I do what the Father says. So the world can see that I love him. Which means obedience is a product of love. It naturally flows out of you when you agape love the Lord. And the life of Jesus, we saw that love was the driving force of his obedience to God. It was love. He obeyed God because he loved him. This wasn't some emotional type feeling type of love. But a love that demonstrates itself through action. 1 John 3 verse 18, let's go there. Let me pull it up, pull it up as well. One John three eighteen. We're gonna start from verse seventeen. If someone have enough money to live well and sees a brother or a sister in need. But shows no compassion. How can God's love be in that person? Verse 18. Dear children. Let's not merely say that we love each other. Let us show the truth by our actions. See, Jesus didn't just say, I love the Father, I love the Father. He lived a life that proved that he loved the Father. What is compassion without action? You can't say you're a compassionate person, but there's no action to support that claim. Compassion is not just feeling sorry for someone. It's, it's not even empathizing with someone. It's empathy and actions. It's doing something to help their situation. Let's go to John 8, verse 29. And he who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone. For I always do the things that are pleasing him. Do you hear the language of Jesus? His heart desire is to please the Father. All he wants to do is please the Father. Is that your heart desire this morning? Do you desire to please God? Do you desire to, to do what he says? John 4 verse 34. John 4 verse 34. Jesus says, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. In other words, what matters to me most is his will. Can we say that what matters to me most is his will. I don't mind a big house, a nice car, great career, but what matters to me most is his will. What matters to me most is his will. Obedience is the product of love. If you love the Lord, you will obey. 
The next thing I want to talk to you guys this morning is about surrender. Because agape love, this love that we're talking about, and in order for us to grow in this love, we need to learn how to surrender. To grow in love, we must surrender. To obey God, it requires surrender. So let's go to Romans 8, verse 13. Romans 8, verse 13, it says, For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put, the, put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. The NLT version says, but if through the power of the Spirit, you put to death the deeds of your sinful nature, you will live by the Spirit. What does that mean? With the strength of the Spirit. Through the power of the Spirit. With the help of Him. Which means you can't do this alone. If you're going to grow in this love, you cannot do this alone. And it requires you to surrender to the Holy Spirit. To demonstrate this love. So surrender is required. Because unless you surrender, you cannot grow. Unless you surrender, you cannot love this way. You cannot do this alone. You cannot grow without the Spirit. You cannot grow without giving the Holy Spirit room to strengthen you and to equip you to live the way that God has asked. You can't do this alone. You need the Spirit's help. But to get the help, you must receive it. You must accept it. You must allow the Spirit of God to help you. You must relinquish control to receive the help. And we do this by surrendering. And surrendering requires your participation. God is not going to surrender for you. You must be willing to surrender to Him. It requires your participation. There's no surrender without your own participation. You participate by moving out of the way. And by allowing God to do what only he can do in you. If you don't move out of the way, God can't do anything. He's not going to force himself and cause you to surrender to him. That's something you must choose to do. You must allow him in. For him to help you. You must open up your house. And say, Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. I give you room to move here. I give you room to teach me how to love. I give you room to teach me how to forgive. I give you room to show me how to live the way that you want me to. You participate by moving out of the way. What is surrender? The word surrender actually means to cease resistance. It's to stop resisting. It's to cease striving. The word surrender means to give up, to stop fighting. Like I said last week, to stop bargaining with God. And to allow him to have his way in your life. It means to let go and to release. To give in. Surrender is willful acceptance and yielding to God in his will. It's willful acceptance and yielding to God in 
in his will. When we surrender, we are letting the Holy Spirit help us. We are giving him the access to showcase his strength and power in our lives. Surrender is yielding to the Holy Spirit. When you yield, you pause to let someone pass. You stop and you're like, okay, you can go. When you yield, you're saying, God, have your way. Surrender is not a confession of the mouth. We have beautiful songs that speak about surrender. And sometimes in a moment of just emotions, we'll say things like, I surrender. But it's not necessarily our heart's posture. It's not necessarily what's going on on the inside of us. It's words, but it's not real. It's words, but it's not authentic. We don't really mean we surrender. Because once God asks us to do something, we take back control. The word of God says this. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. If he lives, he is in control. When we refuse to surrender, we take back that control. It's not a confession of the mouth. It is the openness of the heart to God. The heart decides. It starts in the heart and is demonstrated in your actions. It's an internal decision you make to let God take control. It's refusing to bargain with God and to instead Rest and partner up with God. Where there is surrender, there's humility. And humility is just putting yourself low. It's about position. It's about not seeing yourself more than you should. And valuing the God that you serve. I want us to go into a story. We're going to talk about King Solomon. And I want us to go to 1 Kings 11. And we're going to start from verse 1 to 4. And then we're also going to read verse 14. So let's go there. First King, First Kings eleven. Y'all with me? All right. Chapter eleven. Sometimes the opposition we face in our lives is in direct correlation to our disobedience. You remember the first time that I preached? I, I said that we need to understand that God principles do not change. They do not change. There's no exception to them. You can't say, you know what, I've had a hard life, something bad has happened to me, so God, I, I have, it. There's, there's a reason why I can't obey you. There's never a reason where you can say, God, I have the right to disobey. 
There's never a reason where you can stand before God and say, Lord, you should understand why I'm disobeying you. There's no exception to disobedience. Right? So there's no, not, God's principle remains the same regardless of what you choose to do. So whether you choose to obey him, his principle for obedience remains. And whether you choose to obey him, his principle for obedience remains. There are consequences for whatever decision you make. You choose to obey. There are consequences for that. And you choose to disobey. There are consequences for that. The difference between them is that one of them is good and the other brings destruction to your life. And if we look at the people of Israel and their relationship with God, every time they disobeyed God, it brought faith famine, it brought drought, it brought destruct destructiveness in their lives. God allowed attacks. The principle of God does not change. There's never a time where there is an exception to that rule. There's never a time where God says, you know what, daughter, it's okay. You don't, you don't have to obey me this time. You're going through a lot. I mean, this person hurts you so bad, I can understand. The standard that God has for us doesn't change. He gives us the Holy Spirit to help us. But the standard does not change. And we see this in the life of King Solomon. He was a son of David. And he did great things in the eyes of God in the beginning of his reign. But he lost his way. And so we're going to talk about that. We see that King Solomon disobeyed God's command and intermarried with other nations. God told the people of Israel that you cannot marry with other nations. Why? Because these other nations serve other gods. And if you marry them, most likely you're going to serve their God. So you cannot intermarry. So let's read this 1 Kings 11 all right so I see some words I can't pronounce but I'm just okay so <laughs> verse we're, chapter 11 okay so King Solomon however loved many foreign women what does it say King Solomon loved foreign women besides Pharaoh's daughter and it lists the the different types of women that he likes. And verse 2, it says, There were from nations about which the Lord had told the Israelites, You must not intermarry with them, because they will surely turn your hearts after their gods. Nonetheless, Solomon held fast to them in love. He had 700 wives of royal birth. I don't know. He had 300 concubines. And his wives led him astray. As Solomon grew old, his wives turned his heart after other gods. And his heart was not fully devoted to the Lord his God. As the heart of David his father had been. Do we see that? David loved these women. I mean, Solomon loved these women. So much so that he was willing to disobey God to marry them. Whatever you love 
is what you will submit to. When you truly love something, you will submit to it, whether it is good or bad. And this is why we need to grow in love with God. Because if we don't grow in love with God, we will grow in love for something else that will take us away from God. Because there's no in between. The Bible says it's either you love God or you love money. There's no other choice. You either love the Lord or you don't there's no other choice you have to make a choice you have two options you have to make a choice I'm going to live my life for God and love him or I'm going to live my life for the world and love it the word of God says he loved these foreign women and because he loved them it says in verse in verse 2 towards the end it says he held fast to them in love that means he would not let this go in other words he would not surrender this weakness or this struggle to God and because he did not surrender it unto God his heart turned away let me tell you something there's always something fighting for your love let me tell you this the enemy will send things to, 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 to grab to, to appeal to you there's always something fighting for your love but you have to decide and choose to love the Lord and to love his people and this is not a feely touchy type of love emotional love this is a choice to live according to what God has asked you it's choosing God every day. If you listen to this flesh, you will love all type of things that you should not. And this is why we have to choose to love. We have to learn how to surrender. Every time I hear preachings and teachings about King Solomon, I hear about all the things he gave God and how wise he was. But not that many talk, talk about how he lost it all. If you continue to read, you will see that the same nations that God allowed him to defeat were the same nations that God allowed to defeat him. Everything he gained, he lost. Everything God gave was removed. Come on, hallelujah. Everything. In verse 9, let's all go to 1 Kings, verse 9. Verse 9, it says, The Lord became angry with Solomon because his heart turned away from the Lord and the God of Israel, who has appeared to him twice. The Lord became angry with him because his heart turned away. Now, here's my question. Will you surrender what will turn your heart away from God? Will you surrender the sin that you love, the things that you struggle with, the things that your flesh have a hard time saying no to? Because if you're not willing to surrender, you're making a choice to go down a path that God did not call you to. Solomon chose these women instead of God. He chose what his flesh wanted. And in the end, he lost everything. The principle of God does not change. Solomon gave God a lot. Thousands of animals. Queen Sheba came to see him. 
God said, you know what? Because you are so wise, I will bless you. And when he disobeyed, everything he gained, stop. Let's go to 1 Kings 11, verse 14. It says, Then the Lord raised up against Solomon an adversary. He raised every single nation that defeated him against him. Things that you've overcome things that you've things that you've dealt with when you begin to live a life of disobedience all the wars that you've won will all come back they will all come back and I know this oh my Lord. because this has happened in my life I know this because I've seen this happen in my life. We have overcome something. And I'm crying out, victory, victory. Yes, God, I've overcome this area of my life or this struggle. And I begin to fall away. My heart begins to wander off. And I begin to disobey what God has asked me to do. And the very thing that I had victory over is now back in my life. And I have to go back into prayer. Back into fasting. Back into repentance. And saying, God, please. The principle of God does not change. You must meet him where he is. You must meet God where he is. Obedience is his expectation of you. That will never change no matter what you go through, no matter what you face, no matter what temptation, no matter what may come your way, no matter what persecution, no matter if death is your is face is, is what you're facing. It doesn't matter what it is. Obedience is expected of you. It doesn't matter what it is. Even if people were about to kill you for your faith, would you obey God in the moment of death? Will you obey God when it's hard? It's still expected of you to obey him even in moments like those. Obedience. His standard doesn't change. He held on to these women. They begin to influence him. What you won't surrender to God will influence you against him. I'm going to say this again. What you won't surrender to God will influence you against him. You think it's okay to linger in whatever it is that you're struggling. What you won't surrender to God will influence you against him. Your heart will turn cold. What? It will eventually lead you astray. It will control you. This was a man of great wisdom. But somehow he didn't have the wisdom enough to understand that I need to surrender this. You see, that was the difference between him and David. David sinned against God, but came to God and surrendered his mess and surrendered his sin and came before God and repented. Solomon, Solomon, if you read the scripture, there's not one time where you see that Solomon came before God and surrendered. <sighs> Sometimes we don't want to surrender because what we're going through is too much. We're too afraid. We don't want to lose control. 
But we have to be willing to. Surrender. And the good news is that we have the Holy Spirit to help us. We have the Holy Spirit to keep us. We're not alone in it. So when we open up ourselves and we say, God, I surrender. He comes in and he backs us up. Do you understand what it means to have Jesus as your backup? When you decide to surrender, he backs up that decision. When you choose to do what he asks, he backs you up. He gives you the strength and give you the power and give you the desires to do what he's asked you to do. But you must take that first step and say, I am choosing to surrender. I don't know how I'm going to keep this going, but I'm choosing to surrender. This is a struggle, God, that I keep on going back to. But God, I'm choosing to surrender. God, I don't know if this will ever leave my life, but today I'm I'm choosing to surrender. I'm choosing to surrender. I'm choosing to let it go. And I promise you, the very thing you love, God will make you hate. David says, I hate the things that God hates. We serve a God that can change your appetite. We serve a God that can change even your desires. Oh, don't, don't you think that God is weak? Our God is not weak. I don't care what you're going through. I don't care what you're struggling with. God can change what you desire but you must surrender he can change what you desire but you must submit he can change even what you want but you must submit you must surrender he can change it he can change it he can change it I know it because I've seen it in my life. There were things and desires that I had that were not of God. There were desires that I had that, that, that made me wander away from God. That almost took my heart away from him. But I said, God, I don't know how I'm going to stop. I don't see how this is going to ever be out of my life. But I am choosing today to surrender. God, here I am. And every day I go before the presence of God and I say, God, here I am. I am. Change my desires, change my appetite, change what I want, oh God. And little by little, I begin to see the things that I desired, the sin that I used to love. I no longer loved it anymore. In fact, I couldn't stand it. My prayer is, God, yeah. let me hate what you hate. Et and let me love what Et you love. God, let me hate what you hate. And let me love what you love. Let me hate what you hate. And let me love what you love. Oh, God, let me hate what you hate. And let me love what you love. To love the Lord is to be on his side. It's to be on his side in every single way. You love what he loves. You're against what he's against. You're about what he's about. And you can't stand what he can't stand. It's to be on his side. Now, for the next couple of minutes, quickly, I want to talk about overcoming temptations. Now, I wasn't going to include this, but the Holy Spirit pressed this on my heart. And God taught me something about overcoming temptations. That I think it's very important for you to understand. Because sometimes we do not grow in love. It's because of those things that we do love. That are trying to keep us away from God. It's a war of desires. You have a desire for God, but you have more, a desire more for the things of the world. 
désir pour le monde. You want the Lord, bon Dieu, but the world has a strong hold on you. Mais le monde au fort. You need to learn how to overcome temptations. Because if you're going to grow in love, you must be willing to surrender, which means you must be willing to deny your flesh and to say, I choose God every single time. And you cannot do that if you do not learn how to overcome the temptations that come your way. Because those temptations will never stop. They will not stop until the day that you die. They will not stop until you get your resurrected body. Body. until the day that you die you will have temptations you will have things that's always trying to make you turn away and if you don't know how to master that if you don't know how to you use your words use that word no and tell your flesh no you'll have a hard time obeying god 1 corinthians 10 verse 13 The Bible says no temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. Come on, let me hear everyone say, God is faithful. Come on, say, God is faithful. And say, God provides a way out. Come on, say, God provides a way out. Our God is faithful and he provides a way out. The first thing that I want to talk about when it comes to this verse is that no matter what your temptation is, it is not unusual. God knows. It's not something so crazy that God never heard about. It's not uncommon to him. He knows. That's why the word of God says, no temptation has overtaken you except what is common. Except what is common to mankind. So your temptation, it's common. God is aware of the things that tempt you. Your temptation is not a special case. It's not foreign to God. No matter how strong or overpowering it may feel, no matter how different or weird or unusual it may be, you are not the only one struggling in this area. And with the help of God, it can be overcome. Say, God is faithful. God is faithful. God did not set you up to fail. God did not set you up to fail. So your temptations are not something that God is surprised about. You can overcome them with his help. The second thing that we see in the scripture is that your temptation is not beyond human resistance. Which means God does not allow the enemy to tempt you beyond what you can bear. What does that mean? God does not override your free will. Your will is one of the most powerful things you have. God himself respects your free will. That is why God doesn't take control of you and make you pray and make you read your word or make you worship him. He values and protects your free will. It's the most powerful thing you have and you have it against the, and you can use it against the enemy. The Bible says he will not let you be tempted beyond what you can say no to. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can say no to. He will not allow the enemy to tempt you beyond your ability to say no. 
Because God values and respects your free will. I don't know about you, but that just makes me so happy that God has put a limit on the enemy. Your father, your faithful God, he has put a limit on the enemy. The enemy can't do whatever he wants. He has to work within a barrier that God has given him. God has given him a barrier that he cannot cross. And that is your free will. Which means you can choose. Which means you always have a choice. I don't care how back up you feel. I don't care if it looks like there's no other option. There's always a choice. There's always an opportunity for you to say no. I will not do that. Or I will not say that. Because your free will is protected by God himself. And because your free will is protected, there is no temptation, no matter how strong, no matter how um, overpowering it feels, that you cannot decide to say no. Your temptation is not beyond human resistance. So if this is true, why does it feel like we don't have the ability to say no? If this is true, why does it feel like we're stuck? Why does it feel like the enemy has control? Why does it feel so hard to obey? Or to do what God wants? It's because your temptation or struggle is something your flesh does not want to say no to. The problem is not the enemy. The problem is you. The problem is your flesh. The problem is there's a part of you that doesn't want to let it go. That's the problem. That's why you're stuck. You're stuck because your feelings are at war. There's a war on the inside of you. And there's a part of you that does not want to say no or that's unwilling to let go. We see this in King Solomon's life. He was unwilling to let these women go. The Bible says he held fast to them. He couldn't let them go. He loved them more than God. It's not the enemy. It's your love. Check who do you love? What do you love more than God? Because whatever you love more than God, if you look deeply in that area, that's where you sacrifice the most. That's where you submit the most. That's where you surrender the most. That's where you make the most sacrifices for. What do you love? Whether it's a secret sin or the struggle to forgive someone, you are in a cycle because you won't say no and you won't let go. This is not God. This is not the enemy. In fact, you've partnered up with the enemy to stay where you are. The Bible says God is faithful. He did not set you up to fail. So he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability to say no. Which means the power is in your no. It's in your choices. It's in the ability to choose. That's the most powerful thing you got. The ability to choose. The The ability to choose. You see, this is what Jesus died for. Your ability to choose. He died, yes, to forgive you, to save you from your sin. But he also died to restore your ability to choose. To restore your free will. Because before the cross, we had no choice but to do what the flesh wanted. We had no choice but to live according to what the enemy wanted. But now, because of the blood, we have the ability to choose. We have the ability to say no. We have the 
ability to do what God wants. God says it is for freedom that you have been set free. Galatians 5 verse 1. It is for freedom. It is for freedom that you have been set free. Meaning he died for your freedom. And in the same verse it says, do not go back to slavery. God set you free. But a lot of us are going back to slavery. Oh, Israel was set free from the Egyptians. But a lot of them wanted to go back to slavery. Why? Because their faith was challenged. Why? Because God told them to do something they didn't want to do. So they rather go back. Don't go back. You have the ability to choose. James 1 verse 13 to 15. It says, when tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by the evil. Nor does he tempt anyone. Verse 14, but each person is tempted when they are dragged away. By their own evil desires and enticed. Then after desire has been conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. Do you see what it says in verse 14? That a person is tempted when they are dragged away by their evil desires. It is their evil desires that causes you to be tempted. There would be nothing to tempt if there was not a desire already on the inside of you. The enemy just uses what's already there. He uses what's already there. He uses what's already on the inside. He uses something that you're already struggling with. How do I overcome temptations? It's very simple. The word of God tells us how. In 1 Corinthians 10 verse 13, he says, but when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you will endure it. So what does God do? He provides a way out. What does God do? Say it. He provides a way. Say it. What does God do? He provides a way out. So God is doing his part. He provides. And that's what he does. He's a father. He will always make provision for you. Create an opportunity for you to win. So he provides a way out. What is your responsibility? Well, your responsibility is to go to the path that he's provided to take the path of escape if he provides a way out if he's showing you hey this is your way out now your choice is to say you know what God you showed me my way out I'm going to walk this way out but what we do is God provides a way out and we're still looking back we don't take the way out we don't choose the path of escape he provides a way out you must choose the path of escape and follow him out do you understand how do we overcome by taking the path of escape created by you created by God for you God offers you an escape from your temptation but you must take it it all comes down to making a decision to surrender when you decide to take the path of escape laid out before you you are surrendering to God in that moment God provides a way out for you. God provides a way out for you. If we look at how the enemy tempted, tempted um, Eve and Adam, the first temptation ever was when the serpent spoke to Eve. And I want us to examine this a little bit before we go. The first thing we see, 
that in order for them to, for it to, for there to be temptation there must be a desire now there's no way in the word of the Lord that we see that Adam and Eve had a desire or was struggling with a desire to eat from that forbidden tree but you see the enemy sowing a seed of desire desire in Eve's heart so in other words he, she, he changed how she saw the fruit the Bible says she began to desire the fruit as the enemy was speaking to her so she began to desire what God told her to stay away from we see the enemy he always uses desire he always uses desire. And as people of God, if we're going to grow in love, if we're going to grow in our faith, we must learn to surrender our desires. If we're not willing to, we're going to struggle to serve God. And God never meant it to be a struggle. The Bible says this is love for God to obey his commands and his commands are not a burden he didn't design the Christian life to be a burden for you it works when you are surrendering to God when you are when you are wholeheartedly into it when you made a decision to serve God with all of your heart it's not a burden it's a privilege. Son privilege. It's a joy. Son joie. It's a joy. Son joie. To be a part of the kingdom of God. And what breaks my heart is sometimes I feel like for Christians it's not a joy anymore. It's not a joy to, to serve the Lord, to be different, to stand out. It's like we want the world more. The very thing we desire and want we have. But we're running to the world as if it could satisfy or fix anything. Now, is, now this is why I understand why the word of God says restore the joy of our salvation. Lord, restore the joy of our salvation. Restore the joy of our salvation. Restore. Bring me back to that first love. Do you remember when you got saved? When you first got saved, how happy you were to, to obey God. You were looking for opportunities to do what he says. You were looking for opportunities to speak to people that didn't know him. It was a joy. It was a joy to worship. It was a joy to read your word. You dig so deep into the word of God. It was hard for you to put the Bible down. It was a joy. Lord, restore the joy of our salvation. We have the best thing in the world. There is nothing we are lacking. There is nothing out there. We have what the world needs. We have the solution to every single problem in the world. Every single problem in the world. We have the solution and the solution is a person. His name is Jesus. We have Jesus. We have Jesus. Let's stand. Your salvation is a gift. It's not a burden. Yes, there are challenges. Yes, there are hard times. But if you look at the disciples' life, they weren't miserable people. Read the story of Paul. You won't see misery. Read the story of Peter. You won't see misery. 
read the story of Jesus you won't see misery there there's no misery you don't see them complaining you don't see them wishing they were in the world but you saw them burning with the heart for God and with the heart for the people that does not know God to know him Lord, restore the joy of our salvation, oh God. Restore the joy of our salvation, oh God. We don't want to be King Solomon. We don't want to be King Solomon, God. We don't want to choose what cannot satisfy for a moment of pleasure, oh God. But we want you, oh God. We want you. Oh, come on, just lift up your hands in this moment and begin to say, God, I want you. I choose you. I'm choosing you. Restore the joy of my salvation. Restore the joy. Restore the joy. Restore the joy of my salvation. Oh, come on, restore it. Restore the joy, oh God. 